You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors. All right, everybody. That music means it is Education Wednesday once again. Time for a little program we call the Options Boot Camp. A lot of cool kids call the old OBC. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the T-H-E OptionsInsider.com. Hope you're enjoying the content out there, having a good trading week out there. Remember, if you do like what you hear, throw some stars our way. It does help New people discover the content just like our friend Craig. Craig Starr did this week. He says five stars, and he has a question. He says, uh, I, I always say, don't ask questions in your Apple or iTunes or Google reviews, wherever you leave the reviews, because we tend not to get to them in a timely fashion. I don't know when this came in. But he says, do Mark and Dan ever attend events like the Money Show? Would love to meet them one day. Well, interesting. 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 We'll get to that in a second, our thoughts on The Money Show. Of course, if you like what you hear, you want to throw some stars away, we appreciate that. And, of course, if you want even more content in your lives, only one place to go, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. Congratulations to our member, Mr. Meats with a Z, who won our pro trading crate for the month of July. You want to get your name in the hat for the August pro trading crate. Trust me, as well as, of course, all the exclusive content, 200-plus episodes waiting for you the second you hit that button. More fun all the way. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. The place to go to learn more as we go to see who's joining us on the old program today. I am pleased to welcome back on the black-hatted one himself, Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring. Mr. P, welcome back to the show. And as uh, Craig Starr wants to know, do you, you ever attend events like the Money Show? He would love to meet up one day. Uh, no, I used to back when they were a thing. But um, the... Uh, nobody goes to them anymore. So, um, it's just, it, it, it's not, it's not worth my time to go. So, uh, I don't, but sometimes if there are in-person events, um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking about getting back on the road a little bit. Yeah, it seems like the in-person event schedule kind of dried up post pandemic for obvious reasons. It's yeah. starting to get a little bit back to normal. You and I have a long and sordid history with the money show. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I think you and I met for the first time on a panel at a money show out in oh, Vegas yeah. years ago, many years ago. And I said, who is this idiot they stuck me on the panel with? Somehow he managed to worm his way onto my network. And he's been talking to me ever since, week after week. So I don't know how that happened, Mr. P. So I guess we can blame Money Show for this whole options boot camp thing at the end of the day. <laughs> how weird is that? <laughs> Uh, but yes, you know, interesting, interesting stuff out there. Yeah, I, I won't spend a lot of time belaboring my thoughts on on Money Show and the way they run their stuff and how anyone who just cuts a check pretty much can speak. There really is no validation of anyone's skill set or the fact that they're not hawking a bunch of snake oil. If you cut a check, you can go talk at Money Show. And I don't run my network that way. I don't like things that are run that way. I've expressed that to them many times. You can't just cut a check and come on talk on my network. I think there should be some level of validation done on the people who own the platform. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I've, I haven't really gone back to Money Show. Probably not that long after the one I did with Dan. 
for that reason, pretty much. So uh, intriguing stuff. I don't do those. We used to do a lot of our own in-person events, too. And we kind of got away from those. Maybe we need to get back to those. I don't know. Dan, you'd be down for a live event somewhere around Chicago someday. What do you think? Yeah, you know what? That might be fun, man. Some of our listeners have been mentioning that, hey, you used to do a lot of live shows. We used to take over restaurants and bars here around the area or take over an event venue and have people come in. And haven't done that in a while. Maybe maybe we need to do that. Maybe we need to kick things off again. That could be fun. Speaking of kicking things off, let's do it, listeners. Let's kick off a little bit of the old mail call. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, let's get to it, listeners. A little bit of the old mail call. First, let's pay off the question we asked you folks last week. Last week, it was an interesting discussion. We've seen a lot of flow popping back in and some names that you may be familiar with listeners including your amcs your game stops your maras your sofis all these names that were super hot let's say q1 q2 of 2021 i wonder what was going on back then oh yeah the meme stock palooza so we thought we'd ask you hey you know is is it back is the meme stock frenzy the meme stock palooza is that back? Very simple last week. Yes or no? And Dan, you were, I think, on the fence a little bit. A lot of people would seem like they were on the fence because the results ended up coming down pretty close to split. Nose ended up taking it 54.5% to 45.5% for yes. But we hovered right around 50-50 for most of the week. So this seemed like a contentious issue that split our audience are you surprised, Dan, that uh, A, our audience was so split, and then B, they ended up ever so slightly saying, no, it is not back, sir? No, I don't know. I, I think that that uh, kind of goes right on target, you know? Um, yeah, no. I, I, honestly, I'm not surprised at all. Well, let's see if we can surprise you with this week's question of the week, Mr. Dan. Uh, yeah. We are revisiting our question we usually ask at the beginning of the year, and we did ask it this year. Uh, we asked you, hey, you know, let's just gauge your sentiment for the year. If you had to buy a 10% out-of-the-money call expiring at the end of the year, a lot of people have asked, does that mean you have to hold it throughout the whole time? Yes, you hold it throughout the whole time. There's no getting out early. On one of these four asset classes, which one would you choose? We gave you the you know, S&P 500, I don't care your flavor, SPY, SPX, Bitcoin, WTI, crude oil, or volatility, a.k.a. VIX. Back in January, 43% of you chose the S&P 500. That turned out to be a pretty decent trade. I haven't crunched the numbers. Uh, to see. Bitcoin had a nice run in Q1 into Q2 as well. Uh, WTI had a decent one recently. So I have to crunch the numbers to see exactly what is the winner percentage-wise year to date. But... You didn't do poorly by Inspire at the beginning of the year and holding it. So, Dan, we thought it was a good time to revisit this question. And we asked him again, quite simply, you got to buy a 10% out of the money call right now, expiring at the end of the year. One of these four same asset classes. Which one are you choosing, Mr. Dan? S&P 500, Bitcoin, crude oil, or vol? And then more importantly, which one do you think our listeners are choosing? Oh, boy. Um, I, I think I would go... With the S&P 500, and I think our listeners would choose that as well, um, Bitcoin, I think, probably will come back one day. But I, I just don't think um, – I mean, you know, it's come back so much for sure. But I – it's – it's um, Phoenix Resurrection here is not just yet. Um, crude had a good run. I don't know. It's hard to say. I think the VIX being up here at 16 and a half right now um, is a high enough level. And especially, you know, you get into that last week of the year and it's not uncommon to see volatility fall a bit. So um, with the pullback in spiders, I'm I'm going with that. I'm going with the S&P 500. Interesting. Yeah, you can't really fault Bitcoin. It hasn't gotten all the way back to the 60 plus K level, right? But it's got about halfway there. It's flirted with 30,000 a few times. So it's had a bit of a resurgence there. And I mentioned, (laughs) you know, it's funny, Dan. I I mentioned that at the beginning of the year, 43% of our audience shows the S&P. And right now, with our question of the week this week, 43.5% of them are choosing the S&P again. (laughs) Wow. It's exactly the same percentage wise. Wow, that is a little... A little eerie. Is history repeating itself, listeners? So S&P, SPY, SPX, I don't care your, your poison, pick it. 
43.5% taking the top spot. WTI right behind it, 26.1% for number two. VIX coming in at number three, 21.7%. No joy for Bitcoin, only 8.7%. So I guess a lot of you feel in Bitcoin going to kind of tread water for the rest of the year, maybe drop. Who knows? Out there. Again, follow us at options. That's where you get to vent your spleen on our questions of the week. If you have a comment, something you want to add in there, of course, you can always reply or DM us with those. They're uh, intriguing, usually, the comments that come in on these polls. But let's keep rolling, Dan, out to the much anticipated, just eagerly awaited Passarelli MTM question of the week. What you got for us, sir? Um, you know, I got a question that I thought was interesting, uh, within the last week and it was about, um, covered calls. And the question is, do they work now in this market environment? And the answer is a resounding yes. They work in all market environments. Um, sometimes they are a little more tricky than others. Sometimes they feel more tricky, but they're actually not. And sometimes they're just like really great, but they're always good. Um, Cash cured puts and I consider uh, or excuse me, covered calls and cash cured puts. I I consider to be the same thing basically because, well, because they are. Um, And that said, for that reason, I'm actually uh, putting together revamping our old covered call class. It's actually a class on what a lot of people call the wheel, but um, I have just a different approach on it, so I call it something different, the cycle-recycle trade. Um, So, yeah, covered calls, they work in all market environments, including this one. Interesting you say that because I was just doing a show recently with uh, our buddy, Mr. Matt Amberson from Orats, and he he crunches a lot of data on his back tests, right? And he's been saying, given his back tests, he's starting to migrate away from covered calls. At least he still does them, but he moves – he moves the call so far out of the money that, you know, it's almost vestigial at that point, right? The amount of income you're getting is is nominal because he's still trying to capture that underlying <laughs> pop in those names. We'll have to get him on the show. I'll let him. I don't want to speak for him. And mm-hmm. I'll let him kind of discuss. It might be an interesting point, counterpoint for our audience. We'll see. Maybe our producers can, can line that up. What do you say, Dan? We'll have the great covered call debate. What do you say? Ah, that sounds fun, man. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, Matt's so smart. That'll be great. All right. Maybe we'll set that up, listeners, so we can talk the points and counterpoints of covered calls. Uh, because Dan's right. They still do work in a variety of environments. But these days, with vol kind of anemic, you do have to pick your poison a little bit. You can't just go willy-nilly, just crushing every covered call the way maybe you used to a year and change ago when vol was higher. Things were juicier. There was a lot more wiggle room for writing, writing these things and collecting a decent amount of premium. That said, with vol lower, your chances of getting whipsawed out of these trades is also lower. So there is a little bit of a trade-off there as well. But intriguing, worth crunching some numbers. Now, speaking of crunching some numbers, let's get to our next question here. This comes from Ramen Lover. Guess he likes himself a little bit of the old ramen. I haven't had a good ramen noodle in a while. So maybe, maybe I need to uh, hit up Ramen Lover, see what the best varieties, the best flavors are. But I digress. He says, where do we stand on earnings season trading, is it still worth doing, or is this season kind of a lost cause? I don't think any season is a lost cause, Ramen Lover. Again, like we were just saying with covered calls, you have to be judicious. You have to pick your spots, right? You can't just go willy-nilly out there just net harvesting premium, net buying premium. You have to kind of pick your poison, pick the right spots, pick the right names that work for your style and what you're trying to do. And if you do that, you can always... Farewell. I'm looking at the numbers right now. Speaking of crunching Matt's numbers, uh, he and his team crunch a lot of our earnings data for us, which we make available for you folks for free over there at the website. So if you, Ramen Love, or anybody else is intrigued by what's going on from an earnings season perspective, you want to check out how certain names have performed historically, what they're pricing in now, how the vol is shaping up. What's going on from an overall season perspective? We make all that stuff available for you for free. If you're newer to the options market, you may just take that for granted. You may not realize kind of what a cool thing that is. For years, there really was no data on this stuff. There was no publicly available data on how names perform during earnings season. And that amazed me because we got that question so many times. What's going on? Should I be long premium? Should I be short premium going into earnings? How should I approach this? And so finally, I, I kind of twisted Matt's arm. I was like, hey, you have this data. Let's just crunch out some reports for people and make it available for everyone. And uh, because I pressured him, he said yes. And so now we keep doing it. 
And we've been doing it for years now. We have a great back catalog of data. Prior to this, listeners, really the only way to get this was a Goldman study from over a decade ago. It was hopelessly antiquated. And if, now if you have to go to a big house and be a big client to get access to their research to get this kind of stuff, we don't ask that for you. We just say, hey, we make it available for you for free because we like you because we think everyone should be armed with this data. If you look at this stuff right now, listeners, you'd see that uh, the season right now is clocking in with about 87% of names reporting, 109%. What does that mean? Well, 100% would be every name moved exactly as much as their straddle was pricing in going into their announcement. Obviously, with 109%, that's a little bit of outperformance. It was a little wilder earlier in the cycle. It was 151%. But once more names start reporting, as expected, that percentage came in. It's still looking pretty lofty, though, right now. The longer-term average we have since we've been crunching these data, and it's been... It's been since pre-pandemic, listeners, so it's been a little while, is 98%. Uh, So that is still outperformance, which shows that net in aggregate, premium buyers are winning the dance right now. But that said, every cycle always breaks down to a handful of names that are explosive, you know, whatever. Pick your NVIDIAs or your Rivians, and they dramatically outperform. And then there's a lot of other ones that are kind of treading water. If you want to see exactly how those break down... We show all those for you, too, which names are dramatically underperforming their straddle, which names are dramatically outperforming their straddle. So it'll give you a good sense of maybe which names are uh, are ones that are interesting for shorting, which names are interesting ones you should maybe buy, which ones you should maybe sit on your hands. The other side of this, Ram, everyone always asks is, should I be long or short? And the answer is kind of both. <laughs> the data shows it. There's no right way to approach earnings every time. Just crushing Vol, you're going to get blown out sometimes. Just buying vol, you're going to get death by a thousand cuts until you hit those huge bangers that make back all your money. So there's a lot of nuance baked in there. I can keep going for a while about earnings vol, but I know, Dan, you have your own approach to this. What do you have to say here for ramen lover? He wants to know, is is earnings season trading, is it still worth doing for this cycle or is it a lost cause right now? Yeah, it's it's absolutely worth doing. Um, I mean, there's just fewer opportunities like – when I trade earnings, I go, I go through and I see everybody who has earnings coming out after the close today or before the open tomorrow morning. And then I do my volatility analysis on it, decide whether I should be long or short vol or skip it. It's usually skip it. Second choice is it's uh, or next most frequent is be short vol, do a time spread. And every now and then there's a straddle. But, um, you know, the last um, – month or so there's been just a gazillion uh earnings announcements now we're in what's called retail earnings season and you know they're still announcing there's just fewer of them yes indeed our producer is working diligently on getting uh matt booked on the show he's a busy guy so we'll get him on probably in a couple of weeks and we'll we'll, we'll do that whole deep dive into all things covered call he'll also be a good one to talk about this is his earnings data after all we can talk a little bit about that fun as well i know from us making him crunch this data, it has gotten him more into earnings trading as well. He's kind of gotten the bug for it as well. So once you start looking at the numbers, Ram and Lover and everyone else, it will make you probably a little bit more interested in actually trading this stuff. So beware. But yes, there's always nuggets and opportunities to be found out there. That's the case with all options trading. That's why FOMO, to me, really doesn't make a lot of sense because there's always another opportunity waiting around the corner. You miss one, there's going to be five more tomorrow. <laughs> as long as you get that through your head, then FOMO becomes a little bit more manageable, I think, for a lot of you out there. But that's a that's a psychological discussion for another day. Let's keep on rolling. Let's go out to Hobby, just Hobby. They say, it's an interesting question, Dan. I don't think we've gotten this before. <laughs> if I have in-the-money options on expiration day and I contact the broker to say I don't want to exercise them, what happens? <laughs> Uh, well, not much. <laughs> Mr. Dan, what happens, Mr. Hobby? He calls his broker and he's like, I don't want to exercise these. You know, what happens to him and to his position? Uh, Do they kick him out of his account? A, they close his account instantly? That was a little bit of a maniacal laugh, Mark. I'm just saying. I've been known um, for a good maniacal laugh or two. Like a little Dr. Evil going on over here. Um, so, uh yeah, um, you don't have to exercise anything. And if you do, that's called a contrary to exercise. And your broker will say, OK, let's you know, we're not going to exercise these contracts. So you're right. You don't have to. And, you know, I would say usually that 
doesn't come into play, usually you want to exercise it, um, except for a couple of reasons. One is if, you know, maybe you're long somewhat in the money calls and bad news comes out after the close and it's trading below the strike after the market, you might want to call your broker and say, don't exercise these. If it's a situation where you have to be hedged or have to not be hedged and um, you have some other position on that's going to bring you in Monday morning with a big or small or, you know, big, long or short unwanted Delta, uh, you might choose to not exercise to avoid that, uh, that extra risk, um, and some pin risk scenarios, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you can definitely choose to not exercise that said, if you do nothing and it's in the money by a penny or more, you, those will get automatically exercised for you. Yep. Used to be a nickel and they realized there's a lot of wiggle room in there. So it's just a penny. Now, if it ticks a penny in the money, listeners, you're getting the old exercise. Yeah, I wish, Hobby, I could tell you some magical thing happened. Fireworks went off in your account, but it's kind of boring. <laughs> you just tell them you don't want it. They say, okay. And uh, you live to trade another day. We're getting some <laughs> we're getting some left field questions here today. I like this. All right. Let's go to this one from GKT. They say, a new listener and super noob here on options. Well, welcome, GKT. And, hey, we all have to start somewhere, right? All right, their question, (laughs) they admit it. They say, my question is a little weird, but here goes. I know that you used to be able to ask your broker to send you actual physical shear documents that you could hold in your hand. Is that even possible with options? Can you get copies of your contracts or something like that that you could hold in your hand and keep in your safe deposit box? Wow. That is that is left field. I'll give you that one, GKT. You might get the left field question of the week award. But you're right. Way, way. This is a long time ago. This is almost pre my dalliances with the market. I mean, you could still do it, obviously, but it's pretty it's pretty arcane now. But yeah, there was a time when they would send you the shares in the mail. Here's your documents, and then you had to kind of request it. And now it's it's pretty obscure. <laughs> but you can get those documents if you if you are so. I remember my grandfather as a kid putting shares away or having some shares and documents and giving it. I think they were in Raytheon back in the day. It's a, it's a very antiquated practice. You don't really, don't really see that much anymore. But on the options side, that, that's actually a fun question, Dan. Have you ever tried calling up your broker or maybe OCC and say, hey, you know, I just bought a five lot of uh, Intel. I, I want those contracts. Send them to me. <laughs> what do you think they would say? <laughs> you know, I would call them to find out right now, but the dial on my rotary phone broke. Uh, so oh, yeah. I hate that because you got to wait for the knob to go all the way back. Takes forever. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, um, it's funny. Uh, in stocks, I don't know if any corporation actually prints paper c- certificates anymore. And in options, there were never uh, any paper certificates. I mean, there were... Um, you know, like the cards that the that the floor trading personnel would fill out, but they would go and get punched into, uh, you know, the proverbial computer, and and that's it. There were no actual contracts or anything uh, ever, to the best of my knowledge. I did a quick search while you were talking to see if, if you can even really. It's hard to even get stock shares anymore, stock certificates, right? And yeah. they say most brokers stopped even offering them. There's a couple of companies you could go through. To get uh, get them, but it's a it's an ordeal. It's a practice now, or you can issue some on request to like the company's transfer agent. Apparently, I guess that's, they still are legally obligated to do that if you request it. But <laughs> yeah, good luck, good luck getting that uh, all sorted out. We were just talking about calling your broker for uh, contra exercise orders. Good luck trying to get the actual shares delivered to you. Uh, but short answer to your question, GKT is yeah, there are no physical options contract. It's just kind of a a loose bit of nomenclature that they've thrown around the space forever. There is no actual contract. That would be cool. You know, maybe maybe given the explosion of the option space with newer traders, Dan, over the last few years, maybe we should bring that back. Maybe we should introduce that, I should say, to the options market. You can get a nice little physical collectible with your trade, right? You buy a 10 lot of Tesla, there you go. You get your little, te- you get some contracts in the mail. It's a cool thing you can put on your wall. You can show all your friends. You get a little tchotchke. What about that? People are into collectibles now. We could mix options. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this out loud. Maybe this is an idea you and I should workshop off the air, right, <laughs> sir? Get the options collectible side going. What do you think? 
Uh, yeah, maybe free coffee mug might be better. Um, you know, football phone. Um, oh, football phone. Yes. Now we're <laughs> now we're going. Football phone, some shares, and a mug. <laughs> All you got to do is buy two years of Sports Illustrated, and uh, and you're good to go. Listeners, would you be down for that? Would you be down for some sort of options oriented collectible? I'm curious. Hit us up. Let us know. That would be fun. Uh, here's your Tesla share. You know, we could print them as an unauthorized. We could put in, you know, disclaimer at the bottom. This does not represent actual tradable interest in Tesla. We are not affiliated with them whatsoever. Yeah, <laughs> there could, you go, could man. We print out like some it. of those like bad boys, thinking. putting them out to our, maybe start with our pro members. They get some fun, quote unquote, non-fungible, non-tradable contracts to put on their wall. <laughs> I don't know. I, I kind of like that idea. Listeners, would you be down for something like that? A physical commemorative to go along with your trading? I'm curious. Hit us up. Let us know as we keep going. All right, Jacob. Jacob has an actual question. Not that the other ones weren't actual questions. They were just a little bit, little bit off the beaten path. Right, let's go to Jacob. Jacob says, can you guys do an episode on call ladders? What are they? Where should you use them? Would definitely give it a listen and a big thumbs up. Uh, well, Jacob, you're in luck. We actually did do one of those, not on this program. That's why I say to everybody, you should be subscribed to the full network. I want to say it was a few months back on our This Week in Futures options episode. We had Carly Garner on, and she's big into call ladders and nat gas. And so we had a big conversation about them there, about the use case for them. And that's really where you see ladders mostly go up. It's in the futures options market. So the products like Nat Gas and other things that could have maybe some upside potential. I think if you want to think of them in the equity options context, I think the closest analogy is really the stock repair trade. So you have an underlying that's beaten up. Uh, you own some shares of the underlying. And with the stock repair, you're going to buy a ratio call spread against it, right? Usually an at the money a call, maybe sell two farther out of the money calls on the same strike. And you're hoping the underlying rallies to that strike, and then you get everything called away, and you've broken even at a much lower level. The call ladder for futures options is very much analogous to that. You have usually a future instead of shares of the underlying, and you're going to set it up a little bit differently. You're going to buy one you know, in the money, at the money call, and you're going to sell usually two against it. The ratio could be different. But the two you're going to sell, because it's called a ladder, it's not going to be the same strike. You're going to sell one at one strike and then one at a different strike. So you're kind of getting your, your underlying called away at a little bit different levels. They're a little bit more nuanced than your, than your traditional stock repair trade. And again, they're mostly specific to the futures option space. But that's kind of the best analogy. Think of them as a stock repair trade, but for the futures option space. Dan, have you ever danced with call ladders and then what are your thoughts on them and your your use cases for them jacob wants to know sir um i i mean yeah in 30 years i've probably traded everything but i've ne i i haven't really made a trading system out of that um or or anything you know there's probably just been a time or two when i was trying to do something like the stock repair strategy but um it made more sense for some reason to to sell two different strikes, um, maybe because the strike that I wanted to sell didn't exist. So I'd sell a, a lower strike and a higher strike. Uh, I know I've done that on very, very, very rare occasions, but um, never really made a conscious effort to trade uh, something like that, though. No. Yeah, they're not my favorite thing for a variety of reasons. You can listen to that full episode we did with Carly about them for why I don't like them, but the splitting of the strikes at the upside, a lot of, lot of reasons they're not my favorite, but they're interesting and they have a, a specific use case in specific markets. So if you're, if you're playing around and maybe some of the energy products or things like that, you're going to see some ladders going up there. So it's worthwhile to be knowledgeable of them, but again, not my, not my favorite use case. And again, for most of you who don't play in futures options, the analogy would be the stock repair trade. So think of them in, in similar use cases, similar setups. All right, let's go out to AJ. AJ wants to know, is there a particular options strategy that you think doesn't get talked about much, but more people should be using right now in this market? Always looking to up 
my options trading game? Interesting question, Mr. Dan. AJ wants to know, you know, everyone, we just talked about covered calls. We actually just talked about a very obscure one, the latter. That doesn't get talked about at all. But I also don't think you should be using it. So that's that probably doesn't qualify for, for AJ's question. <laughs> but, you know, all the big stuff gets talked about, the verticals, the, the covered calls, the, you know, the cash secured puts, the straddles, all that kind of stuff. People are kind of familiar with those. Is there anything that you think, Dan... It's kind of flying under the radar, but more people should be talking about right now in this market, sir. And don't just give me call ladders again. Yeah. Um, Geez, man. Um, There's nothing I can think of, honestly. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like on this show, like we try to give as much as we can and anything that I know speaking for myself and probably for you, for you too, Mark, anything that we think is a helpful thing to trade, we tend to talk about. So yeah, I don't know. There's nothing I can really think of to tell you the truth. I guess if I had to think of one that I like that I use myself, it doesn't get a lot of love. And we talk about flies and stuff. So I wouldn't put those in that category. I think it's a good risk reversal, Dan. We risk reversals don't get a lot of love. I think in the in the common vernacular out there my personal use case is uh, like a good bullish risk reversal as in that case listeners you're selling an out of the money put and then buying an out of the money call if you listen to our shows for a while you know that in most equity options and index options the puts are going to be bid from an implied volatility perspective the calls are going to be offered from an implied volatility perspective so doing a bullish risk reversal you're taking advantage of both you're selling a pricier option from a vol perspective you're buying a cheaper option so it works out nicely it can give you a nice swing at the upside bat for a lot of names you think might be poised to turn around of course the the downside is you sell that put so now you're on the hook for the option or the underlying i should say at that striker below of course you can buy put spread against that's going to reduce the amount of premium you're collecting but there's a lot of different ways you can play with it i I don't know if i'd run out and say Bullish risk reversals are my go-to right now because a lot of the names we're seeing out there could be the broad index, could be individual equities. A lot of them are looking maybe a little a little top-heavy right now, so maybe people might be a little bit skittish about selling a put in any of these things and then buying the call on top of that. And I think that's wasted money. So for some of you, maybe the reverse of that, uh, the bearish risk reversal, which is typically known as the collar, might be more up your alley right now. That's kind of flipping the script, so... Now you're buying the expensive out-of-the-money put, and you're selling the less expensive out-of-the-money call to try to pay for some of that. Uh, Spoiler alert, you're not going to pay for it with the call. They they very rarely line up that way. (laughs) Uh, So that might be more suitable for a lot of you out there right now. Again, that's not my favorite for the reasons I just laid out. I'm much more of a fan of the the bullish risk reversal. But in general, Dan, maybe we need to, on the show, do a revisiting of the risk reversal. What do you think? Because it doesn't get a lot of love out there. Yeah, I mean, sure, why not? And, you know, by the way, Mark, I I would just want to uh, ask you to clarify for the folks at home here. Um, So you are mentioning a collar as being the opposite of a bullish risk reversal. But in my mind, I think of a collar as definitely being long the stock. But I, yes, when you're there's talking a, about there is a stock component to it. Yes, yes, that is true. Because you're collaring the stock. Listen, so that that is implied. But you're right. I probably should have said that there as well. You have the stock usually when it's a collar. Otherwise, it's just a bearish risk reversal. So there you go. A little bit of clarification for Dan. I don't know if you know this, but Dan's uh, Dan's other life. He moonlights as an accountant. So he's very precise. <laughs> he's got to dot the I's and cross the T's, listeners. So, so yes, collar means you're probably collaring and underlying. All right, we'll get out of here on this question. I guess this is more of a comment here from X Open Outcry Local. I like that handle, Dan. Hmm. I wonder what he used to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he just chimed in on one of our recent episodes to say, I was in my senior year of high school in the burbs of Milwaukee, and we went to the Merck and the Board of Trade for finance class in 1981. That was it for me. 18 years old. I started as a runner the summer after graduating I have seen it all. I think he sent this in, Dan, on the episode where you and I were kind of reminiscing about our early days on the floor and kind of how we got into this. I think he was sharing his own personal uh, entryway, his gateway into the world of mm-hmm. market making. Unfortunately, for a lot of you out there, listeners who are listening to this now, who are newer to the world of options, that trajectory is no longer there. There's not really much 
in the way of a floor for you to come tour with your high school class <laughs> in Chicago anymore. I mean, there's still a few around. I've been recently to the new SIBO floor, so they do still exist. They are still putting up paper, but the notion of a big trading floor with a lot of products on it and a lot of paper coming in, a lot of traders on it, brokers coming in with orders going everywhere, uh, that's pretty much gone. Like The exchange is what they have now. They're, most of the flow is going up even there electronically, and it's smaller pits, smaller crowds, and a hand-picked number of products down there. Like you go to the SIBO floor, you're going to get your VIXs and your XPXs and a lot of their proprietary products and maybe a smattering of the few uh, top equities down there. You're not going to get the the full gamut of the market the way you used to back in the day. So unfortunately, uh, what lured sounds like X open outcry local and Dan and myself to this, you know, that hustle and bustle, that crazy mad experience that was the trading floor uh, not really around anymore, Dan. It's understandable. Things have to evolve, but also maybe a little bit of a shame that people who are newer to the space, they, they can't get that exposure, Dan. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I don't know, like in a way it's sad, but, you know, in a way, I mean, hey, man, like the world just keeps changing. So that's just how it works. And you, if you don't change with it, you get left behind. So, um I don't know. There's a lot of other advantages, too. I mean, I never thought that I'd be just sitting in my home office uh, doing all my trading from here. You know, I I figured I would have to go down to an exchange floor or something, but um, just a different world. That's all. It is nice. We are approaching that mythical day I've often talked about where you could run your hedge fund from uh, the shores of Tahiti if you want. <laughs> and we are pretty much there at this point from a little laptop, a little – you can even do it from your phone at this point. So we are pretty much there, Dan, at that mythical day. It didn't seem possible all those years ago. But, uh, yeah, you have lost that that moment that you could go down and see all this just explosion of action. It was really – it was the tip of the spear – of capitalism you could see the economy just at its most naked and bare right in front of you playing out and it was it was fascinating and certainly for someone like me it's what lured me to this and that just doesn't exist anymore so that is gone Uh, but dan is right access has improved costs have come down it has democratized this i guarantee a lot of you listening to this look at the explosion of listeners we've had to this show over the last couple of years most of you probably would not be listening not even know about these products if things still were the way they were back a decade or two ago in the world of options just the barriers to entry were enormous and the costs were enormous so nice to see that coming down nice to see the democratization coming in we always welcome new listeners and the trading floor was by no means a great place but for those moments those those banger moments when things were really popping off it was unlike anything else on the planet. And Dan, this show is unlike anything else on the planet. Unfortunately, that music means we have come to the end for another banger week of the show. How was it, Dan? Did you have fun? Yeah, you know what? I always have fun on the show, and um, I look forward to doing it again next week. And before we go, Dan, if folks want to hit you up, they really want to dissect the nuances of the collar trade with you, or maybe a good call ladder. Where should they go? What should they do? Sure. Glad to help. Make your way on over to markettaker.com. Two T's in a row. And um, yeah, just hit us up. You can still join our chat room for free for the time being and uh, take advantage of that. And right now, if you sign up for Dan's chat room, you get a free stock certificate from the name of your choice. Just tell Dan what name you want. And he will print out that that non-fungible, non-tradable share. (laughs) <laughs> and send it to you. <laughs> Written in any color crayon you want. Yes, yes. His kids will draw up the coolest stock certificate for you mm-hmm. and send it your way. But hurry, that's a limited time offer. So head on over to Market Taker. Don't forget the second T for Theta. Or in this case, transcribing your stock certificate. <laughs> And see what they have cooking over there. Of course, if you want to see what we have cooking on the old pro side, only one place to go, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go. Hopefully, you're enjoying the rest of the network as well. If you're not listening to the full network, man, you are missing out. Like, for example, the episode we did on ladders on futures options. So all sorts of fun lurking there. And then, of course, back again uh, tomorrow with the option block and the aforementioned this week in futures options. Uh, two fun shows. Friday, of course, if you like a little bit of vol in your life, volatility views, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern. And then, of course, after that, for all you pro folks, 
We're back with options oddities, breaking down the crazy week that was from an unusual trading perspective. Then back again next week on Monday, we have the option block episode one, as well as the crypto rundown. Just had a great episode with the folks from Coinbase Derivatives. That may surprise you. They have a derivatives chain, but they do. They just got approval for their futures, which has uh, sent the stock into a bit of a tizzy. So that's kind of interesting. So moving markets there on the old crypto rundown program. And then, of course, uh, Tuesday, a lot of our pro Q&A episodes, as well as the advisors option. Then back again next Education Wednesday, another episode of Options Bootcamp. Stay safe out there, everybody. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>